so it's Friday 13th and um, pretty sure I lost my plug last night and um, yeah so hopefully that means something might start to be happening <laughs> um, two days until induction did go on a 10k walk on Wednesday because that's what the midwife um, recommended and I've been living on my ball um, and my cervix was still too high and not soft enough so hopefully this is a good sign. And this is the reality when you can't sleep very well. <laughs> You, I've been up, I don't know how many times, um, been getting pains, just, yeah, sleep before the baby comes. Ignore that advice, it doesn't happen. So, today's the day, it is Sunday the 15th of May, um, it is about 20 to 8, so done quite well. I slept a lot better than I thought um, I was going to. Um, but yeah, I've got to ring at half past eight to see what time the hospital want me to go in to be induced. So yeah, I was supposed to have a really relaxing day yesterday, but it didn't quite um, work out that way. I ended up uh, cleaning all of the windows in the house. I then got a magic eraser um, and just went around like the doors and the skirting and the walls and I was getting off all the scuffs and things um, and then I went outside and I you know, started to sunbathe because it was really, really nice weather um, but it's just so uncomfortable to lie down at the moment so I ended up washing the car and <laughs> um, I checked that I could easily take the car seat in and out and just potted around and made sure everything was yeah kind of finalized and done and the house is ready to come back to and, and that sort of thing so I did end up having a little pamper session um I just you know had a really long shower like took my time washing my hair, used my tropic oil in my ends and my hair is feeling so nice. Um, yeah, I had a, a shave <laughs> everywhere. That's one luxury of induction, I guess, that you know when you're going into hospital. Um, I did some fake tan, I did my nails and yeah, then just chilled out and went to bed and now today's the day so yeah so they want to try the balloon catheter with me first so because it's not a medicated induction I should ha actually hopefully be able to come back home but we are going to take all of our hospital bags and things just in case because I've had two failed sweeps so not very open <laughs> Um, the doctor's concerned they might not be able to get the balloon catheter in so if that's the case they'll probably start me on a pessary um, or um, on the drip so in that case I would have to stay in so we're just taking everything just in case as a precaution but yeah um, let's see where today takes us So, bit of an update. <coughs> I am at the hospital now. So, I came in yesterday, which was Sunday the 15th. Um, 
I rang at half eight when they told me to yesterday, but the labour ward was heaving so they couldn't get me in. So they told me to ring back at one o'clock and thankfully um, they had some space, told me to come in at three. So that's what I did. And I thought I had hit the jackpot. Um, I was taken through to the birthing centre. Um, I was put in a room called the Primrose Room. I'll pop a little video um, just now. So yeah, as you can see, it was so nice. Um, the beds in there are like two weeks old and their memory foam. That was the birthing pool and everything. And it was a room all to myself, but I didn't get to stay there, unfortunately. They just did a load of examinations, popped me on the monitor to listen to baby. Um, they did an internal examination uh, wasn't dilated at all, heads baby. Um, you can tell that I've not had any sleep. Baby's head um, is still too high. And they said that if I had the balloon catheter, what would happen is that when the balloon inflates, it will actually encourage baby's head to move up higher, which of course, that's not what we want. So I was given a pessary um so i have had to stay in which is not great um but i was kind of expecting it i was predicting that i wouldn't be ready for the balloon based on my sweep um just four days previous um close for business so yeah i was moved to a ward at about half past six last night um, thankfully, there is only a maximum of four people in a room. Um, the lady that was next to me has had her newborn. It's for antenatal and postnatal people. Um, so the ward is very noisy. Uh, but thankfully, the woman with the newborn, she went home about half past eight last night. So there's literally only one other person in a bed opposite me. Um, however, her waters have broken. So she is just being constantly monitored. So whenever I did actually manage to drift off to sleep, I was either woken up because they were coming in to monitor her, or I was woken up because they were coming in to monitor me, or I was woken up because I could hear other women screaming, crying, and projectile vomiting. <sighs> um, when I was awake, I could you know, hear the odd baby, but actually they're not really the problem at all. Um, but I really struggled to sleep last night. I've been in um, a lot of pain with this pessary, a lot of low abdominal cramping and low back pain. Um, it is basically like the worst period pain ever and it comes on literally every five minutes. Um, lasts for a minute, I get a four or five minute break and then it just ramps up again, which is not very nice. It's not very pleasant. Um, so I've probably had, I don't know, two hours sleep in total, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. And then I was really annoyed. They came to do my observation about half past five this morning. Um, I actually managed to fall back to sleep after that. Um, everywhere seemed you know, quite a bit quiet at that time. And then they woke me up again at quarter past six saying I needed to do my COVID swab. And I was like, how many times do you have to do this? Because I only did it yesterday. And she said, oh, you're Naomi, right? Nope. <laughs> so this midwife had just completely got the wrong person. So not only has she got it wrong, which is terrible, um, she woke me up for no reason, so wonderful, but yes, it's about 9am now, I've got up, I've 
uh, cleanse my face with Tropic. So glad I brought my ABC kit and my Rainforest Dew. I feel like a, a new woman because I've brought that with me. Um, yeah, just getting some fresh air and thankfully, as you can see, the grounds are actually really nice. There's lots of greenery and trees and stuff. So yeah, midwife said, I just need to be up and walking as much as possible. I've requested a birthing ball last night, still not got one. So when I go back in, I will ask again, because otherwise I'm just going to be either standing by my bed or sitting on my bed and neither is ideal really. So I should be getting examined at some point today to see if this pessary has actually done anything or if it's just causing me a lot of pain for no reason whatsoever. So I'll update you when I know. So I'm afraid the updates did stop and um, things kind of took a very quick turn and I didn't really get much chance to film anymore so I am actually home now and um, I have been home for just over two weeks so I'm home with baby um, and I thought I'd just hop on and try and finish the story um, I'm probably going to end up just doing it in bits because um, I'm alone at the moment, Aaron's just gone out to do the Tesco shop, so it depends if the uh, little one <laughs> decides to wake up and need my attention. So basically I'd left it at the pessary. So they'd kept the pessary in for 30 hours, they wanted to do the max amount of time because if possible they wanted to do the least amount of induction methods if possible. So after 30 hours, um, they checked my cervix and I was only one centimetre dilated. So I was absolutely fuming <laughs> that I'd endured all of this and the pain um, for such a long time to just be one centimetre. I was not impressed. So they said, okay, um, now you are one centimetre, we should be able to get the balloon in. So they had to wait until the labour ward was available. So I had to wait until 10pm on the mon on the Monday, on the Monday. <laughs> um, so they took me over, um, examined me again and tried to get the catheter in but I was just so sore like throughout my whole pregnancy I've been very sore um it's yeah just basically being a no-go zone um and she said there was no way they were going to get it in still um because I basically just kept pulling away whenever she was trying to to get in so they said oh we'll give you some gas and air to relax you Oh my goodness, um, I did not react to the gas and air well at all. It was absolutely horrendous. Um, so she told me how to do it, um, and so I was doing it the way that she told me to. But um, the pain got so much when she was putting the balloon in. I think I was just, I was breathing too quickly and taking in too much and I genuinely felt like I was leaving my body like I, I thought I was going to die <laughs> and that sounds really dramatic but I really I really did and I all I remember is that I took it out of my mouth because I was panicking and it was like everything had gone into slow motion. I could kind of hear what they were saying kind of on delay. And it just felt like I was spinning. 
and I was blacking it out and then all of a sudden I just randomly came back round and I I was just burst into tears, completely burst into tears. Um, I didn't think that um, they'd actually been able to put the balloon in because the last thing I heard was, oh, she's not coping, she's not coping. But when I came round, it, it was all done. So... Oh God, I was in I was in such a state, and I don't think it helped that I'd already been in hospital for over thirty hours. I'd had no sleep. I've been in pain. I've been completely on my own. Um, I told Aaron, you know, not to bother coming in during the visiting hours because it's like a twenty five minute trip to the hospital and then twenty five minutes back and. He would have just been sat there bored with me. It just seemed pointless, really. And he had jobs he needed to do and just getting things ready in the house and stuff. So I think I was just really overwhelmed. But anyway, they did manage to get the balloon in. Um, so then I was taken back to the ward where I was staying. So I went back to the ward, I think, about half past 11 and then I just tried to go to sleep straight away. Um, I woke up around 3 a.m. I think that's because they were coming round, because they come round like literally every two to four hours to do checks. Like they check your blood pressure and stuff, and, and then they monitor baby and things when you're being induced. And I just noticed that I felt really wet. Um, and so after I had my blood pressure taken I kind of got up and felt myself and my pyjama shorts were just completely soaked and I'd soaked through to the sheets a bit as well so I went to the toilet um, and I'd thankfully put a pad in because I thought if I'm having the balloon then there's a good chance that it might set things off and it's a good job that I did because uh, yeah, my waters had broken and my bloody show um, had started to come as well. So I went to the midwife who was on the night shift and explained it to her and she said to me, oh okay, well we'll monitor it so go and lie back down, go back to sleep and, and we'll see later on if um, you get any more. And I was like, okay, I've got a pad here that's kind of got the evidence and my pyjama shorts are soaked which she could see um but anyway I thought okay they're the professionals I'll just go with what whatever they think um it then got to about 5 a.m and I'd soaked through yet another pad so I spoke to another midwife um and she said okay yeah give me your pad um will take it away and I think they can like analyse it um, to check that it definitely is your waters or something. Um, but yeah, then another couple of hours went by. I still hadn't heard anything, so I went back to another midwife and said, oh, can you please, you know, chase this up? Um, so she said that she would. Um, and it got to 11 in the morning, considering I th from like 3 a.m., I was convinced that my waters had broke. Um, I went to another midwife and took... Um, I was wearing these big disposable tenor knickers by this point um, because there was so much. Um, and she just said straight away, yes, your waters are definitely broken. Um, I'll come and see you in a moment. Anyway, she came over and she said, you've got a balloon catheter in, haven't you? And I said, yes. And um, she said... When did you say that you um, thought your waters had broken? So I told her it was at 3 a.m. And she was so shocked because um, she said, well, we need to get that out of you immediately because that could cause infection. Yes. Just always have to advocate for yourself, guys. Make sure you do. Um, if you think something is wrong or you're convinced something's happening to your body, then... Your instinct is usually right. So anyway, she deflated the balloon and took the catheter out. Thankfully, you did not feel that. <laughs> that was nowhere near as um, traumatic um, as putting it in. 
So now my waters were broken, so they just wanted to see if I could try and labour naturally, which of course I wanted as well, so then I'd be able to have um, the water birth that I wanted, so yeah, it's a bit of a waiting game really, so um, I rang my husband, he came in, um, and we just like walked around the grounds, I was on my ball, um, and I started contracting, um, at first they were kind of I don't know, every five minutes, not lasting very long and they weren't very intense, they were uncomfortable, um, but nothing kind of major really, um, but then it got to around 6pm um, and they were getting a lot more frequent and a lot more painful, but I was managing it with my breathing, um, I'd read the hypnobirthing books, so I was using all of that, um, so I, I was managing to get through it. Anyway, the um, midwife came round to monitor me, and I explained it to her, and it just seemed like because I wasn't screwing the place down, she wasn't happy for me to go on the labour ward yet. In other words, they were way too busy and they didn't want me on there yet. That's the kind of vibe I got anyway. So, yeah, um, it was quite annoying because the visiting hours finished at 7pm. So that would have meant that Aaron would have to leave. But then if I started to go into like actual like active labour... Then he'd have to come all the way back and I explained this to her and she said, okay, what we can do is I will tell the night staff that he's allowed to stay with you um, because you will be going into active labour at some point. Um, but I don't think they were allowing it kind of for the whole night. It was just for the next hour or two to see if things ramped up or not. Anyway, um, they came round and um, like they checked me and things and I was still only two centimetres um, and so I just said to her and I was like, look, nothing's going to be happening anytime soon, go home, um, go and see to the pets, <laughs> so we've got a cat and a dog, um, so they were needing letting out and feeding and that sort of thing. Um, go and get some food, go and get some rest, because I had a feeling it was going to be a long process. So, he did, he went home, um, and that's when it all basically <laughs> just turned to crap. So, I went for a bath at about half past nine. I thought, I'm just going to you know, stay calm and... Apparently having a bath is a nice kind of natural way to speed things up a bit. Oh my goodness, by 10 o'clock um, I was in horrendous pain, absolutely horrendous pain. Um, so they came around and they put the monitor on me, which was really frustrating because lying down while you're having contractions is like the worst possible thing. <laughs> it's just, you, you don't want that you want to be up or you want to be bouncing on the ball or just doing anything but lying down. Um, but they had to monitor me. They could see that um, my contractions were a lot more consistent and the TOCO rating was getting a lot higher. And again, I was breathing through them, but it was really quite painful. Um, but... They left me on it for, I think it was about two hours in the end. And they just said they were going to contact the labour ward. Um, and when they had availability, they would send me over to the labour ward, basically. Um, but they said, I think, was it by 1am or something, that they'd definitely get me over there. So they kind of gave me this time limit so then obviously I was in contact with Aaron letting him know so he thought that he'd probably be coming back um <laughs> I then 
had like an absolutely horrific episode where I felt this massive pop in my stomach and just all of this liquid came out and I was then just absolutely hysterical um just cry my eyes out I thought something was really really wrong I think I was just so tired and lonely and fed up by this point that my emotions were just completely all over the place um managed to get the midwife to come over no it was just more of my waters going um so things were really starting to ramp up and one of the midwives it was a student midwife she was lovely um she started gathering all my things together and they sent me over to the labor ward um that was a mission in itself just walking over to the labor ward because i was having to stop literally every minute or two whilst having these contractions in so much pain um anyway got over to the labor ward into my individual room um where i would have a one-to-one -one midwife um and oh sorry one moment <laughs> i think that was a false alarm just a little cry in the sleep <laughs> um anyway yeah where was i yes so the doctor that was in there could see the amount of pain that i was in and she said to me look you are two centimeters if you were going through this already I would seriously think about having an epidural and I was like <laughs> I wanted to do things kind of as naturally as possible but I didn't want to touch the gas and air because of what it had done to me <laughs> um yes during the balloon catheter and I didn't want pethidine pethidine and because I know that it can potentially affect your baby so I was like, mm, I'll see how I go, and I think after about half an hour, I was like, get that epidural in me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, by about half past one, um, they put the epidural in. That was an experience in itself, um, having to stay completely still whilst having contractions not the easiest thing having to say all the time contraction so then they would stop what they were doing because you cannot move when you're having a contraction it's just physically not possible um but anyway that was done so yeah i managed to then contact aaron <coughs> bless him oh dear um, I managed to contact him, I think, about half past two. Plus, I think they were probably all worried sick about what was going on because I hadn't contacted anyone since about ten because I just was completely out of it. Um, and just said, look, I'm going to just try and get some sleep. I'm still only two centimetres. Nothing's going to happen in the next six hours or so. Just get some rest and come over as soon as you can in the morning basically oh we're very grouchy we're very grouchy oh dear oh dear um so yeah i managed to kind of be in and out of sleep at least i wasn't in pain anymore um but I was bed bound, so that wasn't the nicest. Anyway, um, Aaron and my mother-in-law, they came, I don't know, I think it was about half seven, eight the next morning. Um, and basically just sat with me for the whole day. <laughs> so they were checking me every four hours. This day is just a complete blur. I think we just wanted some attention <laughs> uh, so yeah it was a complete blur so they had 
measured my cervix at about half past eight that morning and I had dilated to four centimeters so I managed to do that naturally overnight but again still not moving very quickly um, and then it got to about half past 12 and they checked me again and I had dilated to six centimeters so we were like All right, okay if it's like two centimeters every four hours um, should have the baby by about 8 p.m. and yeah that'd be all great um, but then they measured me again I think it was around two purely because um, the 3 p.m. mark would um, have marked the 36 hours since my waters had broke so then after that there's a chance of infection so they measured me then and I was only seven centimeters so they basically said um, we need to get this going um, because of the risk of infection basically so they put me on the drip <laughs> okay so it is now about two days later <laughs> this is uh, what happens when you've got a newborn and you're trying to record um anyway picking up where i left off so um i had been told that i was only seven centimeters dilated so they needed to put me on the hormone drip they wanted to get things rolling so yep yeah, i was on the drip um and they checked me again um about half past six typical she's been asleep and then as soon as i start filming we start kicking up <laughs> and yeah so half past six checked me again and it felt like she was fiddling around in there for about 10 minutes or so so we just knew it wasn't going to be good news and eventually she said I'm really sorry you're still at seven centimeters so we all just kind of looked at each other then and just knew what was going to happen I was three hours past the um, infection mark um, I had started to develop a temperature, they had put me on antibiotics to try and get it down um, and then she said that the reason she was fiddling around so much is because that um, she could feel swelling on baby's head so not only did I have high liver function from my bloods I had developed a temperature um, I was three hours past my um, for my waters breaking and baby had swelling on the head they basically said we we need to get baby out oh and my waters had started to smell as well so they were assuming um, I had an infection or I was starting to develop one so, um, yeah, I had to be booked in for a C-section. Um, I hadn't really processed in my mind before that of the possibility of having a C-section, um, which was a bit silly of me, really. I just, I don't know, thought it probably wouldn't happen, but alas, it did. So this was about half past six um, we were told that uh, like a emergency, emergency um, C-section was just happening. Excuse me. Yeah, so there was a like a full on like emergency, they need to get the baby out now situation happening. So we knew we had to wait um, and we thought we were next in line. And then um, we were told that there was another like full on emergency one and because baby wasn't in any distress at all every single time the midwives came in and checked on baby they were saying oh you know they're having a right party in there it's like they're sipping on a pina colada on the beach or something um so i wasn't priority in that sense um but it was an emergency c-section because of 
the infection and how it could have affected me basically and potentially affect the baby in the long run if it was left too long. So I wasn't wheeled in until about eight o'clock, I think it was. Um, but it was a bit of a nightmare because I missed this information actually. Um, I did start to get into quite a bit of pain um, around four o'clock. Um, I, like I felt like I could feel my contractions again and um, they checked the epidural and there was an airlock so they had to have um, someone come and have a look, flush it through um, and then just kind of like put me back up with it basically. Um, but then when they decided that I should have the C-section they then didn't administer any top up because they give you the epidural but a much stronger epidural for the C-section and I just kept saying to them I was like I'm in pain I'm in a lot of pain and um, it was my lower back obviously I've been lying on my back for hours um, so yeah that was a bit of a nightmare and when they took me into the c-section um what they do is they have like this special liquid um and they, they're like spray it on your hand for example and they say right okay that should feel like ice cold and it does feel ice cold and then um because with a c-section basically from your kind of boobs <laughs> that completely down um you shouldn't feel anything um well it shouldn't feel cold anyway so he kept doing the test of like spraying at the bottom of my belly and then working his way up and it just got colder and colder and colder and colder and it took him 20 minutes <laughs> to administer enough before I was then numb enough like he said that you know you should be able to feel it spraying but you shouldn't be able to feel any cold sensation basically um, and then he'd get like a little pin and he'd do it on your hand and be like okay so that's the sharp feeling and then do it along my belly and things and said you shouldn't feel the sharpness which I couldn't I could feel that it was kind of put there but I couldn't feel the sharpness but yeah it took 20 minutes and then he did apologize and said oh, I'm sorry you must have been really really low um we should have given you that topper before yet again where they just don't listen to you um especially if you, i feel like if you're a first time mum they just don't take you very seriously so yeah if i ever did get pregnant again and go through labor again i would really be putting my foot down <laughs> um but anyway so yeah that took 20 minutes so it wasn't until about 20 past 8 that aaron was allowed to then come in in his scrubs um and then, yeah, they did the procedure. I think that took about 20 minutes, but it was literally about five minutes until um, they took, took baby out. And they were screaming just like she is now. Well, she's not screaming yet, um, but she's definitely getting herself ready. It's, uh, it's going to be dinner time. Um, so yeah the c-section was probably the the most positive experience even though i was really annoyed because before we went in they asked aaron if he'd like to cut the cord so he said yes um, and i'd made it very very clear in my birth plan that i wanted immediate skin to skin no matter what happened unless you know baby was in complete distress and there was something wrong I wanted immediate skin to skin. All they did was literally lift her up so I could see her genitals, so I could see whether they were a boy or a girl, because we didn't know. Um, and I could hear her screaming, um, and they, they whisked her away into the room straight away. And I was like lying there, crying my eyes out, like, where is my baby? Um, and then eventually they brought her through um, into the theatre, wrapped in about 20 towels, it looked like, it was ridiculous, um, and handed her straight to Aaron. So he got to hold her and he got to look at her and I was like doing this, like trying really hard to look, but I just couldn't and I feel like I'm gonna cry just 
talking about it. Um, so yeah, that was really frustrating because that was something that I really, really wanted. So it took about 15 minutes for them to kind of sew me back up and give me the painkillers and stuff and put me onto a different bed and wheel me into the recovery room where Aaron had then gone. Um, so then I did eventually get to see her and get to hold her um, and do the first breastfeed. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was really, really annoyed. Um, and then it wasn't until we eventually came home that I then discovered in my notes that they had written down that I had requested um, that I didn't want skin to skin. That I just wanted her to be passed. Yeah, that I just wanted her to be passed to me when I was in the recovery room. So I was absolutely fuming. Um, and I am going to actually put in a, a complaint as well. Um, and I also saw in my notes that they put down that my mental state was depressed. I wasn't depressed. I had been in hospital from Sunday afternoon until the Wednesday evening by the time I, I gave birth and then I wasn't then allowed home until the Friday afternoon. So from Sunday afternoon until Friday afternoon I was in hospital, I wasn't listened to, everything was a complete shambles, I was frustrated, I was tired, I was isolated and I was lonely. So again, really really annoyed about that as well. So, yeah, <laughs> um, birth experience was pretty much everything that I didn't want. Um, I had, you know, visions, this water birth with calm music and massage oils and all of this. And yeah, it just, it was everything. I wished not to happen, but baby's here, baby's safe, I'm okay, um, and that's, that's all that matters, I guess, so I definitely would not opt to have an induction again, if at all possible, um, I would l wait literally until the last moment I possibly could, it's was just not a positive experience for me, unfortunately. And I really, really wanted to be bringing a, a positive birth story um, for you guys. Um, but I just can't, there, there wasn't much that was positive about it really. Um, except for my midwife um, who looked after me on the Wednesday, um, sadly, when it got to like seven o'clock, um, just before I went to go and have my C-section, um, she did have to finish her shift, um, and bless her, she was absolutely gutted, um, and she asked if she could, you know, check in with the midwife the next day, just to ask how I got on, and everything was, you know, all right, and things like that, um, yeah, she really got me through, she was really lovely, but... The rest of the staff, well, <laughs> ah, so yeah, that was my birth story kind of in a nutshell. Um, we were in the recovery room for a good two hours afterwards, so we were just FaceTiming family and showing them baby girl who we have called Ellery, Ellery May, and um, yeah, May because She's born in May, but we just put a spin on the name and spelt it M-A-E instead of with a Y at the end. Um, and lots of people have asked, you know, where we got Ellery from. Um, because I'm a primary teacher, there's a lot of names that I've been kind of put off. Um, and I wanted something that was kind of unique and it would be very unlikely that I would teach one of these named children sort of thing um 
So yeah, Ellery is actually a really, really old traditional name. And it just kind of, it, that means joy, and um, like joy and hope and all of those things, um, you know, that she has given us being a, a little miracle, a little IVF rainbow that she is. So, yeah, that's where we got the name from. So we were then whisked to the ward and, and then again I was really annoyed because Aaron wasn't allowed to come in because of visiting hours so I'd literally just had her, we'd been in the recovery room for two hours and then he had to go and it was like, are you for real? I can't even stand up, my whole bottom part of my body is numb, I had all of my bags that the midwife had packed up for me because we were kind of rushed over to the labour ward and I was like well what, what am I going to do like how am I going to look after her and um, so yeah again that wasn't the best experience I'm like very independent and don't like asking for help all the time and if I rang the buzzer for every time she cried or needed picking up like I'd be ringing the buzzer every five, ten minutes. It would be ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, I just had to kind of get on with it. But it was so painful every time I was trying to move because of my scar. Um, yeah, just the aftercare was pretty awful as well. And again, you don't get much sleep because um, Ellery had to be monitored um, because of the risk of me being infected they had to make sure that she didn't get infected so pretty much every one to two hours she was being monitored and every one to two hours I was being monitored and it didn't usually happen at the same time so you just you just couldn't sleep and as soon as you did fall asleep they'd be coming to wake you up pretty much so yeah bit of a nightmare um, but thankfully she was absolutely fine she passed all of her assessments and things um, and then I was fine as well so yeah we were discharged the Friday afternoon and it's like she's always been here <laughs> So, yeah, I think I'll leave that there, as I imagine this has become quite a long video now. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to um, comment down below and I will get back to you. Or please feel free to come over to my Instagram page. It used to be Finding Our Rainbow with IVF, um, but it has now changed to Ellery and me, um, because we've found our rainbow now. So... Yeah, please feel free to pop along and you can direct message me if you would prefer that. Um, but yeah, I hope you found this insightful. I didn't make this video to kind of scare anyone. Um, you know, I would 100% go through absolutely everything again to have Ellery. Um, she's worth every moment. Um, but I just wanted, I wanted to be honest and... Things aren't always, you know, daisies and rainbows. Um, sometimes these things do happen. So, yeah. And excuse for the state that I have looked throughout this whole video. Pre-labour and then postpartum. Again, I'm just wanting to be real. My hair is an absolute mess. Um, but... I am going to a wedding in a couple of days and I have to wash my hair tomorrow night so I don't see the point in washing my hair because I need to wash it tomorrow night. So it's a big greasy mess basically. And yeah, no makeup, no sleep, this is what you get. <laughs> but anyway, I'm waffling. Thank you for watching and um, please subscribe if you haven't already. Um, it will really encourage me to keep making these videos. Um, I'm going to be documenting a lot more about motherhood, days in a life with a newborn, weekly vlogs, that sort of thing. Um, and please give this video a like if you enjoyed it. And please give me a comment um, if you've been in labour and given birth before. 
tell me your story or if you've got a video then let me know and I'll go over and watch but yes thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video bye Happy now, aren't we? Hey, are we happy now? We've lost a mitten already. Yeah. <laughs>